Hello and welcome to BioCities. Um, the discussion will be between myself and Rachel Armstrong for context. Today's discussion is tied into World Futures Day. World Futures Day is organised by the Millennium Project and the Millenn Millennium Project is very much concerned with how we tackle the critical issues of people and planet. And there have been there have been events going on all day today. So they started in Asia, and they will be ending the other side of the other side of the planet, the other end of the time zone. Um, most of the discussions that are going on today in World Futures Day are taking place um, in Zoom, and so they are closed audiences. I can just see Rachel's just joined now. Rachel, if you send me an invite from inside this, if you see. Um, a little uh, down at the bottom, down at the bottom of the page, if you can see something so that we can add you in. I'm going to send you an invitation as well, but I know that this glitchy app will probably only let you in if you send one to me. So you'll get one from me now. And then if you send me one as well, we should be able to get you into this. So, um, yeah, so today's, hello, Rachel, success. <laughs> <laughs> we always have this we always have this but it would be a shame if we didn't i mean i've missed the glitches <laughs> how are you i'm good i'm good i'm still i'm still figuring things out so <laughs> well, we are what will probably happen is we'll really figure it we'll really suss it and then they'll switch it up again <laughs> they'll put some new buttons in to confuse us are you in belgium yes i am i am i'm in ghent yeah Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And it's all going well there? I love it. I, uh, I, I love being on the continent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, I will be back on the continent at the end of this month for a couple of months. So maybe I'll have to get the train on down and uh, come and see you. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, so today, so as I mentioned, Rachel, this is, uh, this is tied into World Futures Day by the Millennium Project. So all day today, there have been discussions going on between future thinkers around the planet, um, but this is the only conversation on the future of cities, let alone on biomaterials, living architecture, and all of that. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so we're, we're covering that base. Um, now, I thought we could maybe freestyle. I thought of three general kind of questions. Have you thought of three questions that you would like us to touch on? Well, I, 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 yes, I, I can, I, I can do three, and I, but I, I think for me as well, I think that the, the city is a place for really reimagine. I, I, there are two feelings I have about cities. One, yeah. cities are over prescribed and given too much importance as a city as a whole, and not enough um, uh, reflection on how we live and, and the kind of the domestic sphere. So for me, I'm, I'm very keen on the domestic sphere. Uh, cities are waved in front of us as being sites of economy and you know with that comes all the uh, pollution carbon footprints um, you know and, and all the troubles it, 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 that come with density as well as all those advantages so I can see why cities are high on the agenda um, but I think we have fundamental questions that also need to be addressed um, which really go to the heart of cities and, and one of the things I'm really interested in and keen on is, is the whole notion of land ownership and the mobility of people. Mm. I would love to personally see more flexible uh, mobile cities, nomadism, uh, more, um, yeah, let's, let's say, um, earth territories rather than national territories. Uh, yeah. and, and that is a, is, is a bit of an ideal, but um, I think when we start to think about, you know, how we live together in the near future, we really need to shift some of these paradigms because I think one of our biggest challenges has been this whole territory, uh, you know, uh, issue with conflicts of war and resources. And as the climate gets, um, you know, more extreme, uh, people will move, um, and they'll have to move, and they'll have to have a basic standard of living. So, um, thinking about cities as being a fixed entity, I think is. You know, it's part of our history, but I, I would also like to entertain other futures. I think that's really key. I mean, I think that's touching on the fact that within and of the lineage of our species, and if we get into the genus as a whole, 
we have only been permanent settlers for a really tiny amount of time, haven't we? I mean, I think the earliest known structures were in the Neolithic. They were the mammoth bone huts over in Siberia somewhere. Um, so for the majority of our time on the planet, we evolved physically and one could say emotionally to be out in the natural world. And then we settled. Obviously, we think we settled between the Euphrates and the Tigris, but who knows? I mean, with so much of the what would have been the historic settlements potentially under the waves, pretty much everything, uh, the sort of advent of the Holocene, you know, shortly before then, the territories we were likely living in on the coasts, many of them are now submerged. So was was you know was the near east the advent of cities or have we missed something that is out there and we haven't yet found but we know it's pretty recent don't we and um as you say right now we're, we're entering into this new geological epoch call it the anthropocene or whatever we want to call it but we know from the data clear as day we're going to have to move around we're going to have to move around in terms of some nations are going to become submerged and we may not be able to actually retain uh, livability in some of those those areas. Then we know even in even in places where we can, we, we do have enough land uh, that will not be below the waves. We know even there, as you said, there's going to be much more stochasticity. There's going to be much, much more pressures, many more pressures on the environment, food scarcity, water scarcity. And so, yeah, I think this is conflict key. and, you know, horrible forms of nationalism and all that kind of thing is, is just get, it's, that's going up, uh, you know, through the roof before, let's say, the, the, the big climate disasters. You know, we've got climate disasters going on, which is putting pressure on populations. It's going to be the population um, issues that are going, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, birth control or anything. I'm not really into that. <laughs> no. you know, people are people, uh, you know. Um, what we need to be able to do is to create the conditions for livability. And I think that requires, a, I, I like Bruno Latour's re-territorialization of the world, you know, where it isn't human boundaries, uh, because th th those come from greed and bullying, you know, where we defend the, you know, we walk the boundary of our territories and we can defend them with sticks and stones and often, you know, a little group of men in a castle, you know, kind of aggressively controlling a domain whilst, you know, other people are put to work to, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to grow crops and, you know, provide all these other services. But this kind of ag aggression that has gone with territorialization, whether we have sanctioned it in forms of monarchy or forms of governance, it's always the same kinds of bullies at the top. You know, um, and, and everybody else kind of mopping up the, um, let's say, the difficulties in between. And, and I think there are other forms of settlement that are needed. Maybe we don't need to be dense. Um, I'm not quite sure why dense. You, you know, I, I, I get it for a market based economy. Um, but in terms of a kind of nature based form of living, the diversity and the kind of you know, kind of local situatedness of the materials we use, the foods we grow, and a kind of let's say natural um, uh, uh, settlement um, uh, density, you know, so we know people by name, that kind of thing, and. Uh, I'm not romanticizing that because uh, my grandmother, you know, is, is, is in a rural village and it's really annoying when everybody knows your business before you do. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, yeah. I mean, you know, there, there are freedoms and responsibilities with everything, but there's definitely enough space in the world. And mm. if we were better neighbors with the natural world, maybe we could be more facilitative in, um, you know, uh, helping biodiversity, sowing crops, um, you, you know, kind of increasing uh, the variety of, of, of ways of, of, of settling rather than this kind of global homogenization resulting in, you know, the international style and a, mm. and a very homogenous set of expectations for spaces. So th that, that's my resistance yeah. to, let's say, hold the city up as a kind of single unit that can be solved. Uh, because I because I think it embodies a certain kind of dysfunction in in some ways, many freedoms and the other. And so I guess for me the 
conversation really is about you know how do we how do we uh, using these kinds of uh, uh, tools you know these these non extractive and more sustainable um, choices for settling the planet um, you know how how might we find a, a new type of, of, of city that's I think um, you know what I think what's really interesting about this I mean I think when we look to the history of architecture we know that architecture is very much the manifestation of politics of the economics of who's in power of what they want to project of how they want to rule we see that you know one of the things I always point out with modernism is that prior to the advent of that sort of very brutalistic um, industrialized schema um, architectures the, 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 the architectures that we invested the most in, that we, we um, considered to be, if you like, the finest um, buildings in the world, they, almost all of them were religious or they were, they were speaking to a higher power. They were either speaking to a God or a deity or they were speaking to nature as with, um, you know, sort of the Art Nouveau movement. And so it was about more than the human. And when we look at the sort of the, the materiality of those architectures, there were places for nature. They didn't just, let's say, take the Natural History Museum. When you look to the, the building of the Natural History Museum, you see all of these stone um, uh, iterations of nature in its many forms. But um, what you're actually seeing is an architecture that can actually accommodate of nature. And it's got, a, it's got little nooks, it's got crevices. It's got, it can account for what I call the bats and the belfry. You, you know, nature can actually coexist with this form of architecture. But then when you move to modernism, you've got this, these um, monuments to humanity, these celebrations of humanity. There's nowhere for nature. They don't visually celebrate nature. They don't integrate any aspect that is, um, will accommodate for nature. I mean, uh, you know, maybe some pigeons can kind of perch on the roof or kind of get a little tiny ledge to, <laughs> to ledge sort of uh, make, make sort of a temporary, uh, a temporary sort of resting point. But they're not... They, they just speak to the human, but they also speak to economics because, of course, they were the product of the Industrial Revolution. And then, of course, they went globalised. And when we think to cities today, when we look at the materiality of London, what we're not physically seeing is a materiality that is speaking to meeting the needs of people, the problems of London and the urban wildlife. What we're seeing is massive, great big developments that are all about property developers trying to get the maximum buck out of a bit of land mm -hmm. and we know that that's problematic because we know that as a schema that attracts investors for the wrong reasons that's why london's got a whole bunch of apartments that are barely lived in because they're owned by a chinese billionaire russian oligarch although not so much the russian oligarch anymore um they're owned by these very rich people that have these massive probably some of the biggest properties in london while there are many many people that simply don't either have a roof over their head or they're living in conditions in buildings that are in such a state that in some cases they, we know they should be condemned. Mm. Um, so it's an incredibly inequitable model. And uh, I, I, I guess that's to me, when I think of density, I think of, I think of um, you know, people that just wanna make money. I don't actually think of something that's servicing the human condition and what we need in order to live uh, you know, to survive, let alone to, to, to thrive and to prosper and to create burgeoning communities where opportunity is, is abundant. Mm -hmm. and I, I think this is, this is interesting for me then when we think of, you know, I don't know what we call it, the bio age or the unfolding ecological era or a, the, 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 the beginnings of a kind of architectural thinking and practice that allows something new to happen. And I think that, you know, unlike, let's say, some modernists uh, or even parametricists, that, that, that architecture is political, it's to do with the city. And I think that with the, with the ecological era, there is a new politics for the city. And I'm not really hearing that articulated other than, you know, what you've, you know, you've just said. I mean, we, can, we talk about them as being um, uh, urban problems that can be fixed if enough money is um, uh, thrown at them rather than um, a, 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 let's say a crisis in urbanism as a thing. <laughs> um, you, you know, so, so does the, you know, kind of the biological or the ecological era um, invite a different kind of city? And, and if so, what are the politics of that? Where is the power sharing? What is the relationship to land ownership? Who are the citizens 
of these uh, of the city of these cities are they just humans or are we starting to open up um, city spaces very consciously not just a green spaces which is you know this road for the pigeons only um, but actually uh, trying to think in more um, inclusive uh, uh, frameworks for um, spaces that we're not necessarily always in control of and I think that that's a that's a problem for neoliberalism because uh, you know, space has been carved up and owned by by private uh, organisations so much so that the that the, um, the the citizen is kind of moving in between the fracture lines of of um, uh, your property, um, you know, kind of ownership. And 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 it seems to me there's a, there's a need for a commons to come back into into the city, not just in a few parks, you know. <laughs> But, but much more so in terms of you know how we dwell um, and, and and what our rights are to space um, and um, yes the, the 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 companionship that we have uh, with them with the more than human world and how we actually make spaces um, that, that that really start to help us see what what an ecological city might be you know I mean one of the things I've been thinking of recently is that um and I've kind of had a bit of a rant about it in some of my live streams. It's the fact that when we look to the body of architectural theory, when we look to past imaginations, as it were, um, we find that there are all sorts of interesting and dynamic iterations of what an ecological or biological city could be. We know, obviously, this is not a new concept. This goes way back. We know that there are many and incredible projects around the world. Obviously, we are privileged in that because we get to see what's happening in the um, research units of universities and of sort of various corporations that are sort of doing the right stuff, we get to see just how many and diverse the potential uh, potentialities are. But when we actually look, um, you know, if you were to say Google, green cities, um, ecological cities, or put many, many things into a browser search, which bearing in mind browsers are how most people, most of the populace will try and find out about a topic. If you look at the imagery of the cities, it all comes up with basically plants on balconies. It's Bosco Verticale all over the show, as if that's sort of the only iteration, and as if that's the correct iteration, when, you know, as we know, that is not a paradigmic shift, that what basically that is a tinkering with a pre-existing architectural model that is basically no longer fit for purpose, that is all about what is effectively an energy intensive architecture. It's about permanency, it's about, um, uh, you know, a, a, a very sort of um, lazy kind of architecture, I would call it. Whereas, you know, when we look even to some of the most ancient architectures, when we look, for example, to the East, think about the architecture is in, in India, we have really hard working buildings. We have things that are water harvesting, passively cooling, really intelligent ventilation systems. Um, and that, my God, are incredibly beautiful as well. You know, they've got these amazing reliefs and decorative details. And they're so charming and so extraordinary that even today we're still, even when they're a little bit tatty and they're a little bit sort of run down, we, we're still in awe of them. We still appreciate the original, original designs and they still look fit for purpose, even though they could be hundreds and hundreds of years old. They have endured umpteen monsoonal floods and earthquakes and whatever else. Um, and so it feels to me like there's this narrow, there's, there's this narrowing and it does actually feel at the moment, I feel there needs to be an, an, in, um, an intervention whereby we challenge the fact that at the moment, if we're to be frank, yeah, I work with corporates, love corporates, you know, I couldn't do my research if they didn't fund me because I fund my research through my earnings. But um, it does seem that there is this vanilla-ness, this, this sort of blandness about the vision and it is because of the fact that most of the conversations in corporate are about tinkering with that model as opposed to actually inviting to the table the most radical thinkers actually really getting down to the kind of things we're talking about designing from the roots upwards of these buildings actually questioning the permanency of them thinking about how can the new materiality all these amazing new biomaterials we've got all these amazing new engineering systems we've got amazing new information systems, biological computing spliced with the state of the art in e electronic computing, artificial intelligence, whatever. Such mind blowing potential out there and it's not represented. And so it feels like in order for us to create that space, we've actually got to 
make the space for these conversations to be had. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think to have that kind of conversation, um, uh, I mean, as, as much as you may love your corporates, I think we have to change the economic model. So I think there, there are fundamentals that, that, that we will only ever be wallpapering things green whilst the, the, whilst the premise of the present economics remains. And that's the, that's the problem with governments because they cannot undermine the current economic system because that's the end of their career. Then they have no power and then they have no potential to change anyway. So I think, uh, you, you know, uh, high modernity has reached a kind of stasis and it's going to cling on with its same economic and political models with the gap widening um, between the haves and have nots until the thing cracks and, and, and climate change is is working on it <laughs> yeah. um, so, yeah. so you know this i i, I think we are we're, we're obviously as you as you said earlier you know and in the anthropocene this is this is not a situation that can continue it will it will continue it's, it's going to hang on for dear life but i think for a social justice and an environmental justice we absolutely have to as, as you've just been saying uh really rethink paradigms i don't know if industry is the right person um, I, I, I actually think we're looking at, um, I, I, I would actually put a lot of faith in the, in the uh, young architects coming through um, because, you know, in their careers, they have the potential really to start to forge new broader partnerships that may be um, uh, traditionally um, kind of considered to be a, a, a career trajectory within the architectural field. I think that um, that the, the community, the, the activist communities, there's a lot of disenfranchisement. I think that um, COVID-19 really um, it showed us a possibility of, of a world where, let's say, that the human presence was dialed down. Mm. <laughs> and I yeah. think we yeah. all spent, you know, a good 18 months considering what it meant uh, for us to be decentered in a very physical way, including all the inconveniences of um, uh, you know, supply chains and, and, and all that kind of thing, all the expectations of modernity were for just a moment, you know, kind of held in question. And I think we, we do need to reflect on that, to think about um, uh, a, a position in, in, in relationship to the decentered human in the process of, of construction, ownership of, 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 the, um, of, of the land, um, and the responsibilities that we have to uh, develop an ethics and economics and a politics that is much, much more inclusive. I think it's from a, a personal e e um, idea of an ethics and a politics that then an, an economics, the basis for a trade, a basis for sustaining a life then can emerge. But I think as a designer, you need to take a position. Um, you know, and, 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 and it isn't clear you know, what, the, what the right answer is. But if you do work on your own position, then you can start to identify those opportunities where you can do something differently, whether that is choosing a different kind of material, whether it is working with the space in a different way, whether it is inviting um, uh, kind of unconventional uh, agents and bodies um, in, into those spaces. I think the, the, that there has to be a, a, a grassroots receptivity and I think what we then do is raise the fresh, it's not that that's going to bring about change in itself. It's just going to raise the baseline for a possible new trajectory once those tipping points are reached. We, you know, it's, it's more about at the moment, I think we're preparing the ground. Mm. Um, and, and that may be one, maybe two generations away. I, I, I really don't think someone's going to sit down and go, oh yeah, that, this is what we need to do. <laughs> I, I, I think we're, we're kind of collectively, um, you know, kind of making the foundations of the status quo increasingly more unstable, but by proposing, you know, uh, new possibilities, kind of asking, you know, asking challenging questions. And, and I think the thresholds will be met by networks of difference. And, mm. and that's what's going to hold us up when we need to move. Uh, but, you know, for me, it will never happen fast enough. You know, I think I think there's a few interesting things there. I mean, one of the things um, in 2019, I was commissioned to do a, a report on the future of work. One of the things I highlighted then was that young people um, going into industry, all kinds of industries, 
were already many more times conscious of the ethics of industry. They were concerned about working for companies that were doing good to help people help planet. So they would actively do what I've done and I know you have done and many of our peers have done. We have actively boycotted certain companies and certain industries for years from the outset of my career. I've never worked with a fossil fuel company. I've never worked with a tobacco company. I've never worked with a fur company. You know, there are certain companies that I just will not work with no matter what the price ticket. Mm -hmm. And young people today, although this used to be a rarity, you know, what I said was, we're going to see this. Now at that time, although it was clear from the, the data that we were gonna get a pandemic soon, <laughs> hence why again, that was on the foresight, my keynotes and others were flagging this risk. When the pandemic kicked in, what that did, as you said, it was a reset. And not just in terms of practice, in that people that had, as had we, been working in a very distributed context, working with teams globally, were very much relying on the internet to help us to communicate and coordinate. That became obviously the mainstream, that became the norm. So that proved that that worked. But also, it was the point, I think, which we saw the tipping point in terms of values, the values of people, young people going in. And they said, you know what? I don't want to just go and have a job for the sake of it. I don't want to go and do a dead end job. And now when we look at the data, it's absolutely clear that many young people, when we, you know, the government sort of, the UK government says, oh, young people are all lazy, right? Let's get the over 50s back in. Let's get the retirees back in because young people don't want to do various jobs. Of course they don't. You know, what young person today would want to go and train as a mechanic for a diesel or petrol car when they know full well that EVs are coming online? and petrol and diesel cars are not going to be even sold, you know, by X day. Of course, they're not going to train for a dead end job. They're not going to go and sort of sacrifice their life, knowing and understanding now just how fragile potentially life is that, you know, you've got to make the most of it because this might be your only shot. Uh, you know, I hope to God we are recycled because it would be a great shame if we weren't. But, um, you know, we could, it could be your only shot. And I think I think the value systems have shifted. So I think already we're at a stage where not just in architecture, but lots of professions, that next generation is saying, you know what, industry, you know, you can you can advertise that job for however long you want. You can stick up the pay X amount above the minimum wage and I'm still not going to take it. You know what? I can create my own design arrangement, pop it on Etsy. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know a load of graduates, they're earning more from their own businesses than they would going into industry. And I said, good luck to them because they're already making the future. But the other thing I was thinking about this is that people often assume with systems that the point of collapse comes conveniently. And we see a lot of that in the kind of narratives around, you know, the original IPPC reports um, that were sort of, you know, oh, well, you know, if we, we can, we can just tinker around the edges and then we'll maybe kind of keep the climate and the whole earth system within a convenient range when obviously that was always going to be that was always a sort of question in that you know you've got jim hansen saying we've got to get the the emissions down to at least 350 we had other climate scientists saying 325 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere to avoid uh, systemic collapse within decades you know so there was always a variability but within the sort of the mainstream there was this idea that you know nature could be managed controlled by humanity because of the fact we had this false sense of security having lived in the holocene a very conducive era to civilization and we thought that we were the masters of that when actually you know we were just kind of hitching a ride <laughs> um but now we're at the system sort of collapse point and it is genuinely the point at which i mean well we saw in pakistan wouldn't we massive floods national 33 million people displaced scale floods. It's like, yeah, this is this is it now. This system is changing. Um, and it makes me think to a conversation I had with Nick Clear before Brexit, um, you know, me, ardent Remainer, <laughs> really, really. And he was actually, we were talking, uh, we were talking, we were going back on the tube uh, from, from Greenwich and uh, we were having a chat about Brexit. And he said, well, actually, he said, I think Brexit could be quite good for, for Britain. And I, I sort of said, why? And he said, well, it's the only way that I can see that the UK property market would reach a state of collapse <laughs> such that it could be reconfigured such that young people and you know people that have a lower salary had a hope and house chance of getting on the property ladder and i thought what an interesting lens you know this idea that oh it'd be great to make brexit happen because the impact's going to be so catastrophic on the uk economy that actually we can have a flourishing a reconfiguration of the system from it and so you know, um, it strikes me that we could actually be, we are now at that cusp. So quite as you say, the old systems are falling, 
we know that new systems are needed and it could be that things can figure a little bit earlier than we were thinking about um you know in terms of the change i i definitely resist the accelerationist drive though because it's the same uh actors that suffer from you know accelerated uh collapse <laughs> No, as, as those that suffer from, yeah. uh, let's say, natural collapse. So, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 the optimist in me is fighting hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to, you got to laugh or you cry. Um, <laughs> what I was, you know, what I was thinking here, I mean, I think one of the big, the big sort of um, areas of shift in, in design are from the material to the immaterial. Um, we're seeing that happen in terms of obviously the shift to a much bigger emphasis on the digital mm -hmm. and on digital worlds and a few like um, kind of many companies embracing things that although not new in their concept have now reached the stage of almost mainstreaming so kind of the virtual environments and so forth um, and also you know kind of around basically when you think about borders when you think about issues of territory when you think about the conflicts going on in you know over in ukraine right now this is all about the permanency versus temporary construct mm -hmm. um in design terms what do you think are some of the most interesting iterations uh, of that i think for me i mean particularly for the for the for the digital for the digital you know and and, and i know you'll you'll know this but the but the use of um metabolism as the basis for energy so i'd be I'd be very interested in, um, let's call it a green uh, digital network where our waste, uh, not, not um, incinerated, which I abhor, um, but um, metabolized, uh, you know, managed through, through microbes to generate a range of byproducts from the, you know, combustible gases to, um, you know, direct electrons that can be captured through, through electrodes. So um, the idea of really low power digital for me is is really exciting um, because I think that um, you know that uh, particularly microbes are environmental sensors and um, that means that in some ways we can uh, stay in touch with environmental change through the changes in microbial um, data packets, as it were. And so that we'll be able to see through our you know, digital devices um, just how our environment is um, configured through them. Yeah. Microbes mind, as it were. I like that as an idea because um, I think that uh, micro environments are much more interesting in terms of you know where we can live if we think about many cities they're all on nasty old uh, brownfields contaminated patches think about um, ports think about you know post-industrial sites what kinds of poisons have, have inhabited those realms you know as have been built on them i think we're going to be able to see the, the detail of, of of that damage and i think we're going to need a form of design that bioremediates that actually a type of building um, that is not about harvesting that ground or even settling it straight away, but actually space that becomes livable again, livable for a broader nature. And I think we're going to have to have those skyscrapers because of a certain kind of energy and a certain kind of machinery that allowed us to go up, you know, 20 floors. Um, but I think with the ecological era, there, there's, there's an age of poisons and uh, trauma that we need to actually find ways of, of, of building for. So in terms of the flexibility of that, I, I think that again, you know, I like the, the, the mobility. I wonder whether there are gonna be more wearable architectures. And, and I, would, I would really um, be a big fan of uh, being able to equip everybody with, let's say, survival suits, which are kind of tense, which, you know, are able to metabolize your waste, which are able to keep you warm, um, you know, in, in case of disaster. And, and I think that we really need to be designing those and not just having them posted up on national web, websites going, oh, you know, in case of disaster, you're on your own. You know, <laughs> yeah. most government websites actually right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes me think actually, because when the energy crisis, I mean, one positive thing about the energy crisis in the UK is 
many of the retailers responded and obviously there were all these uh, these videos and stuff on how to keep you not your home warm and of course there is a bit of a fundamental problem with that in that if you allow your home to get too cold you're going to possibly particularly if there's poor ventilation get damp and black mold so you know you've got to kind of get a bit of a balance but it did strike me that we saw a massive sort of um a very quick sort of uh, interest in things like uh you know blankets, blankets that you wear and <laughs> yeah and uh and this kind of took off i mean literally every major retailer in the uk was selling a whole bunch of stuff uh to heat you not your home and to keep you ch you warm cheaply and which of course in turn means low energy sort of and actually flagging up you know i've got a heater upstairs 22p a minute excellent you know um people became much more conscious so it strikes me that when catastrophe strikes when the moment of crisis hits the response can actually be really quite quick mm -hmm. i think if we're prepared it could be but i think that, that you know there there is a there is also that de degree of um uh, apathy uh you know like we we see the bushfires in australia as you say we see the floods in pakistan you know you still have people that don't climate change and and it just makes me think you know what does it take well it, it, it you know it's never going to get there for certain people but no that doesn't mean that as designers we can't be socially responsible and actually start, i think we need to start prototyping um mm. how we're going to survive um yeah. really we're not yeah. going to change buildings per se because the markets you know as let's say as you know a, a small group of individuals we're not going to change that but we can actually prepare for a great deal of flexibility and that will be that will become more and more influential i think again as i say um, it's about raising the, the the thresholds for change to the point where when we get um to, to those tipping points the the stuff we know is activated it's not going it's it's not going to take off before then it will take take off in little pockets but it will mm. reach thresholds when you know the the conditions are weird enough and, and i wouldn't like it to be like that i would like us to be able to change the baselines now yeah <laughs> you know we, we saw even with um the, the covid pandemic how how inexplicably dense you know um <laughs> governments are you know yeah. how can they be so belligerent how can they be mm. so inept you know mm. and, and all these all the baggage of it kind of the bad side of humanity greed corruption all those kinds of things and and we like you know we we kind of dismiss it a little bit with a shrug but but that's you know that's more dangerous to us mm. than the actual challenges we face you know we have science we have design we have people that you know, absolute angels on this planet that would, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, are, you know, walk as gods through the world. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have a ruling class, which just seems to be almost the antithesis. Yeah. Uh, but, but, they, but, but that's dangerous. Um, and so, you know, finding it, it is great. I think you're right about this, Melissa, to, to find allies. Um, but um, yes, it, I, I do think that from the bottom, you know, we, we, we need to be really thinking first principles. Um, mm. as, as you say, you know, how do we keep warm? How do we eat? And, and I think for me, that's why the home is a really good place to think about how, how does the ecological city start to emerge? I think it mm. comes from home-based practices, then community formation, and then the kind of the cultural, social dimensions, and then, you know, trading and communications between different groups and you know kind of activating different different ways of, of living and learning from each other and i think it's mm. very um uh site and place based um and that's not for it to just be local i think it could be incredibly creative and amazing and and i, I you know i also you know love um uh, liam young's you know planet city i mean that, and i think what's nice about that are the cultural figures in that mm. you know, and, and so i can see that um an, an ecological city is 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 much more diverse it's taking let's say the the structural stuff that's already there in from from modernity and the mega cities but transforming it in different ways to find new economies new forms of politics I'm not saying it's a utopia i think it's a babel i think it's you, you know that the, the the strategies to negotiate difference 
are going to be key to survival because at the moment we get you know kind of clashes between uh, people that have very different beliefs very different worldviews you know and, and and that creates you know kind of tensions that lead to war and conflict mm -hmm. um, so so I, I think key to an ecological era is really learning the lessons of nature through um, you know kind of inclusivity through diversity and, and that needs to be managed and so maybe the role of the architect in this particular situation is a kind of broker as as the architect was between property owners and um, kind of industrial um, construction builders you know kind of negotiating between you know the guy who needs the bridge and the people who build the bridge and you know creating the designs in uh, in between that allow these two different worlds to come together I think the architect is going to have that kind of uh, role in the ecological city whether that is from gardens to what we wear to um, trading systems so these again these types of forms of practice I, I think are likely to be quite different than what we see in, in high modernity and what we recognize as the city today mm. no I, I mean I agree and I think um, I think there's a couple of things that are, are interesting I mean one of the things I've been thinking about recently is the fact that we're living in a world that is at every single level physical and emotional and intellectual is organized around neuronormalcy mm -hmm. so it's, it's organized around the assumption that all of our brains are wired in the same way and when you work in sciences and when you work in the arts and when you work in design i think by virtue of the fact that i would say on balance the majority of people you're working with are not neuronormal types that becomes your reality um for me i've only recently discovered that i'm mildly autistic a mildly autistic visual thinker of a whole of object systems thinking kind because although i realized i was a bit of an odd bod <laughs> everyone around me was odd bods of some or another kind so i hadn't actually realized hang on a minute my brain is actually wired differently here but then when i i realized i think hang on a minute all the people i know that think about original things their brains are wired differently and what that actually means is that's quite problematic so there's a couple of things i've been looking at it's the fact that firstly when we look at the way that everything is funded from grants for research in academia through to industry even government it is they are structured the research shows that when the messaging is very simplistic when it's a real back of the beer mat there is a statistical probability um, uh, that is higher of that project getting funding than something that is presented as being complex now obviously how you present information is a product of how your brain is wired so that's why if you or i or you know many other people we get up we give a presentation i mean my ideal pitch situation would not be going in with my bullet points dragon's den style now my ideal pitch scenario is going with, going in with a 3d simulator a simulation that we walk into and we see all around us all the kind of stuff going on all the connectivity all the reasons why we've got to have transdisciplinary we've got to have this team coming together we've got to like have a lateral um balance in terms of the equity that we give the different disciplines that's never going to happen because that's, you know, you're not invited into that context when you pitch, but that totally governs how money is spent. We have a situation where you are told that in order to get ahead in your career, in order to, you know, do anything in life, you've got to fit these, this list of neuronormal things. So we have complete inequity and in the way every facet of our society is uh, run. And the problem is that I don't think it's just within the sciences and within technology and within the creative industries that you find many neurodiverse people today. But if we look back at many of the people that pioneered radical ideas that had all the solutions, when we look at, you know, Christopher Wren, Leonardo da Vinci, Robert Hooke, Isaac Newton, these weren't, these weren't neuro, neuronormal guys. You don't get that obsessive about a subject unless there's something happening with your wiring. You know, so I think that we have, we have a need for a real fundamental redesign of society. But as you say, change doesn't come at that profound level from the inside. Because who that is benefiting from a system, who that is making Shell's profits the highest in, what, 115 years? <laughs> It's actually going to change the system, um, but you can have you can have collapse. And I think another interesting thing about this energy crisis is um, that what we've seen is again lots of people giving tips, 
And when you give people tips, I mean, I created, I've got single glazed heritage windows here. So technically you can't have double glazing. So all that heat and the winds would have been going out. I've taken it down now, but I created a DIY double glazing system using not very environmentally friendly, I'm afraid, bubble wrap, sellotape and cling film, which increased the interior temperature by at least three degrees, stop condensation, stop mold for the winter, basically the worst of the winter. You know, easy as heck to create, easy as heck to prevent a place like this getting black mold. Create a little video, bang up online. It's not rocket science. As long as people have the knowledge to actually modify their space. Same is true, obviously, with, with uh, agriculture. When we think to full grow, you know, they are developing systems to grow furniture, physically grow furniture in an orchard. Um, the whole basis of that whole business, yes, um, is trying to create uh, a prototype, trying to create prototypes for growing furniture. But the idea is not to retain the IP at the end of the process, but to make it totally open access mm -hmm. so that all over the world, communities can be curating plants, growing furniture out in the outdoors, simultaneously feeding their agricultural needs, simultaneously mm -hmm. creating a production system that is integrative of biodiversity and that tackles climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't, it's not actually building a rocket to, that will take a, a, a spaceship to the interstellar space. <laughs> you know, we can actually, we can figure this stuff out. We can get it out there. And historically, you know, I think of past, you probably if you said to somebody, right, well, we're going to challenge the, the factory system. We're not going to have the industrial model where we churn out chairs that are exactly the same and we churn out millions of them um, and in the process we completely abuse earth resources and we get everything on the cheap and then you know we create something that is going to be redundant in about five years time um, if you were to go out and say actually we've got we're challenging that we've got a model here we're ticking all the ecological boxes we are totally reinventing design but oh it's going to take seven years for a chair to grow <laughs> I mean, at past, they might have thought you were nuts. But now, now you've got a situation where, you know, Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy Group are touring these chairs internationally. Sotheby's are going to be auctioning one in, in April. Suddenly people are like, hang on a minute. <laughs> what was that you were saying about growing chairs again? Um, and obviously in the ideal situation, who knows how many people be, could be growing chairs or growing, let's think to Greek mythology. <laughs> um, well, actually, yeah, Greek mythology, um, Odyssey, um, you know, the, the growing the bed, growing the bed. Uh, you know, we could be growing furniture. So um, I think that uh, I think we're kind of at the point now when we could we could actually transition a bit faster than some people are thinking. And that is partly because we've got this collapse coming in, multiple collapse, systemic systemic uh, collapse that is both ecological and cultural. While at the other end, we've got these amazing solutions, many of which are actually quite old in their, con their conception but then we are now managing to utilize different technologies including the communication virtues of digital to propagate in new ways and we are now thinking about due to our resource issues of new places and spaces to apply these concepts i i i agree and maybe the the job for us in the ecological era is find ways of reconnecting because if we are taking a slower view of cities in living, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, we invest time, but uh, in the longer run, you know, there, there are benefits to us ethically, um, financially on a, on, on a different kind of economic scale, because we're, we're not um, damaging the system that supports us. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a different mindset, but I think one of reconnecting in some way because I tell you that the problem with that is it's a problem of Babel, the, the one of understanding and trust and for that you need time so that modernity made us very good individuals wanting to you know have things for ourselves and that our boundaries became rather fixed and defensive um, but I think in order to activate new forms of design we, we're going to have to learn how to be with people again mm. yeah <laughs> And, and, and I think there's a real need for that, to be able to spend time with someone who isn't like you, 
Um, you're sharing a space, you're sharing a chair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so actually for, for the ecological era, I think there's a kind of a, a number of different uh, modalities that we need to really think through. It's not just about designing the thing, it's, it's the context in which it is designed, it is who it is shared with, it's its lifespan, it's, it's inclusivity, you know, not just um, other kinds of people, but other kinds of creatures. Um, you know, and, and this kind of multi-dimensionality. And if you design through a multi-dimensional perspective, your work becomes stickier and, and more able to make the connections that it needs in order to um, unleash its affordances, because there may be hidden affordances in the stuff that you're doing, um, because good design does that anyway. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so I think there's a different approach to design. Um, uh, and um, it, it, it has something to do with, with, yes, of course, you're an individual, but you're not just an individual. You have to kind of embrace those, those uh, uh, network sides of you. Mm. I think also, um, you know, the other thing I've been thinking about is, as you say, we've, we've become an incredibly divided society. We know that that is not accidental. We know that there have been actors that have very deliberately tried to polarise communities particularly um on issues of politics but now more generally they are still being very pervasive in their efforts obviously we know the psychology of this we know that um essentially what's happening is that people's fears are being played within if you like the conservative community we know that on the other end of the spectrum if you like the fears of sort of the the, the liberal community uh, they are also being um, played with because of just the sort of the the amplification of these differentials and the extent to which they're now prevalent within all the media. Um, and so we have got to a point now when we're seeing all of this division and even within and off sustainability, I think one of the things that's concerned me most that I've spoken to is the fact that there are many different ways we can crack a nut. Mm -hmm. um, give 10 designers and engineers a problem and you'll, you might get a few that come up with the same idea, but you will probably get a number of different solutions because there are very few problems where you've just got one answer. We also have the problem that with sustainability in particular, we're seeing a lot of siloed thinking and all, for all the rhetoric, all the, oh, we're going to work beyond silos. Um, we're seeing siloed thinking applied to a lot of briefs. And what that means is that um, no matter how ambitious the the, um, the, the, uh, the project might be, when you look at the end results, you're often seeing a very narrow, um, a, a very not, a narrow concept because often the project timelines are too short. There are not enough people around the table. There's not been enough sort of prodding and poking that you do when you've got something that you're really kind of testing. And there's not been enough um, pushing of the boundaries there's been too much safe work. Um, and so we've got a lot of um, sustainability approaches that are not robust, not really when you, you know, I'm gonna give you an example. So for example, we have now got a lot of imagery for future city that feature plants on balconies, lots of shrubs, lots of trees. That's okay in some situations. It's not okay when you've got a ground zero day in a city, like this could be London 10 years from now, runs dry, completely dry. I know from looking around London last year during the droughts, a whole load of the vertical gardens went dry. They were basically a fire risk. All it would take is a cigarette accident and flick to that vertical garden, up she goes in smoke because the moisture level in the plants had gone to zero. So you'd actually got basically a whole load of fire fuel on the exterior of a building, you got a fire risk. When you look at uh, sort of bushes and trees on exteriors of buildings, when you're putting that in a universal context and you're not, not actually subjecting that idea to different scenarios, what problem have you got there? Well, of course, now we've got the bird flu strain. We've got projections of up to 50% mortality. We've got the fact that, of course, if you stick an ideal nesting site on a balcony, the pigeons are gonna come in or whatever other urban species is gonna come in and nest there. We know it happens because we know in Italy, a number of buildings that had foliage put on the exterior of the buildings found that they attracted so many birds. So 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 loud was the torn chorus in the morning because of having sort of populated these buildings with a load of plants. The people actually put audio 
uh, signals on the outside of the building that would deter birds from landing. So you've kind of got, oh yes, we're going to have an ecologically inclusive architecture, and then oh, oh sorry, we're a bit too successful in attracting the the, the avian life, so we'll put alarms on that will obviously then create a disturbing signal for not just the birds but any of the other species and including possibly people that are living in that environment. So we've got these kind of very singular approaches um, that are very vulnerable. Now they wouldn't be, they would not be if you had a situation where right from the get go you'd had people coming to the table that could bring all different lenses and that you had a space in which there was this comfort in actually confronting very different views to your own and actually going in there and acknowledging that you in every situation you can't hold to your assumption unless you can defend it against a, a wide community of people and i don't think we've seen enough of that in sustainability and it is difficult i, I was having a, a drink with krav menuhin uh, a couple of nights ago and his wife um, and he of course is one of the world's foremost experienced divers he pioneered the first whale documentaries diving with blue whales among other things um now he's got a very different position on some things to me i mean when it comes to climate change clash 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 it's a very difficult sort of that's an area that's difficult for us to reconcile not because of the technicalities of it but because of the philosophy it you know because my view on climate change is one philosophical view one ethical position his is another you know um how do you reconcile issues uh, where you're not actually fighting out the technicalities but you're actually discussing the ethics of it gets difficult but then on other issues on discussing for example how you might engineer how you might design and engineer coastal cities um in an era when you're you know you're facing many more storm systems hurricanes etc ideal man you know ideal man to be talking to but you've got to in those spaces you can't have those conversations where you fundamentally have got some very different views mm -hmm. views that are very much polarized in the press and that many many people are trying to sort of weaponize against different communities you know you've you've got to kind of employ certain techniques and you've certainly got to bring a lot of humility to the table when you are having those discussions and i i don't think there is enough as i said in sustainability and i think there needs to be more what do you think yeah i i agree and that and um i was particularly struck by your um uh, reflection on living with animals because of course the pandemic is a result of zoonosis um and that we have uh, strained our relationship with animals such that uh, our immune systems deal with yeah maybe domestic uh, uh animals but um wild animals uh you know we, we we need a little bit of work with and um you know it makes me think of a, a kind of you know buffer buffer zones uh for, you know, for, for for creatures you know so that they don't have to encounter humans all the time because like if we get a, a nice place we would like to go and you know like in belgium there are very few green spaces on a sunday everybody's there and I, in, if I was a coot, I would be so miffed. Because I, you know, when do I get the space to to me and my coots? You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. because there was all these people here, particularly on a Sunday. And, yeah. and I, you know, I think that, the, you know, the our living with not just other people and the kind of uh, negotiate the difficult negotiations that come with being with. Uh, I, I think we we cannot we cannot underestimate the difficulty of that but the importance of it um, mm. and that i think that you know the that there is a need for an education in that you know from from early um from early times in class and we don't have you know teachers with enough time first of all um you know and and even um let's say ethical frameworks that are shared regardless of your religion regardless of your cultural background there should be you know there, there could be let's say um, uh, kind of basic um, ideas about how we treat each other that should be, let's say, enforced in school, not through punishments, but actually, um, you know, finding ways to talk about, you know, you know, hold people to account, you know, make them, um, you know, kind of see what their behaviour leads to, that kind of thing. But it requires effort. And I think that part of the, the modern era has been about racing through things very fast, you know, becoming part of the machinery that that kind of 
time to be with uh, each other, but also be with and be respectful with the natural world to mm. establish kind of conditions for living with these with, with other creatures, including insects. You know, and I'm, I'm the first one that will swat a mosquito that comes into my room, but I, <laughs> because it's going to get me. Um, uh, but but even so, um, you know, the, the, the creepy crawlies are, you know, and, and, and the stuff that we don't like, the slimes and, and that's all part of the of the living world. And I, and I think that there's a I guess in some ways the, the things I, I would not call myself a religious person, but I would say that there is, you know, I I do have what I would say it would be a spiritual quality. Um, and it and it is really about um, you know when you have another set of values other than money and the, and the things that you, um, uh, you you know you make your transaction with in, in the ordinary world and you, you know um, when you have another set of values to that whether those are religious beliefs or whether those are spiritual beliefs or whether those are you frame them as personal beliefs I think we all need that kind of other layer of, of value because otherwise everything becomes about the vernacular everything becomes about the the the, the, the uh the, the cost of stuff um and i think that leads to an impoverished um existence and, and i think particularly in design if you're only ever doing things for money um you're probably in the wrong job <laughs> absolutely and you know what i was thinking um, i was recently um reading up on um the way that animals see the world differently um animals are very visual we know that obviously by the fact that, for example, prey species have their eyes to maximise their um, awareness around them in the 360 sense, uh, sense of the word. Um, and I was, I was reading up on how this is sort of a bit of a, an odd subject it might be, but how um, in slaughterhouse design, um, a number of interventions have made it less stressful for the animals because there are certain design um, elements that can really freak out the an animals. So it's basically, it was some work trying to look at how that whole process could be made let you know less stressful as said for the animals and a, and a kinder process and that got me thinking about um the design of cities i mean i have never been um invited to, a, to the table for a project where somebody's actually sat down and they've actually not just well i mean generally the, the impacts of design on urban ecology are frankly woefully absent from architectural and urban planning schema in any event i mean it's all very superficial but i've never sort of sat down where someone said well actually you know what we've 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 got the latest technology and we've simulated how let's say this particular building schema this proposal development proposal will be perceived sense through the senses of birds insects yeah. mammals whatever mm -hmm. to see whether or not it is conducive to their sense of physical and mental well-being mm -hmm. um now we do have discussions about light pollution and things like the effects on urban moth populations bat populations and so forth but that's really about as sophisticated as it's got and i think what's really sort of also for us relevant about this is if we were to harness the, these new classes of um information these new lenses literally on the world what we know is that a lot of the stuff that is bad for the animal populations i mean we are an animal basically basically we've differentiated ourselves we've created this this artificial boundary where we have said well yes we're a great ape a great a great ape but oh no we're not an animal our closest ancestor the chimpanzee is an animal but we're not i mean you know classic sort of human let's differentiate this from that when actually it's very subjective as to where the line lies if there is a line but um if we were to actually harness all of that data if we were to get that research if we would integrate that into uh urban design then that would be better for us because if it's going to work for the animal populations it's going to benefit human populations because it's not just them that are you know having to alter their behaviors we're getting sleep deprivation we know that light pollution and noise pollution is linked to higher numbers of cardiac arrest and other chronic failures in in human health so it just strikes me there is so much potential here to do so much more sophisticated work we have got the technology but at the moment we just don't have enough places and spaces for that um and it does feel you know at the moment as i said one of the things that really annoys me my kind of bugbear with um kind of green cities and sustainability at the moment is just how narrow the lenses are and i'd really like to see this whole thing just explode out just so many different conversations about so many um 
you know, many in different ways that we could bring together our existing resources and actually redesign cities that genuinely are a new species that, you know, are truly this new paradigm. Um, and that absolutely do integrate all the potential knowledge from nature, not just in the sort of the sense of form, pattern, these kind of things or, or applications of technology in the biomimetic sense, but actually understanding systemically what information from the ecological and the, the broader environmental sciences could actually do to help us make, you know, future fit uh, environments at, at every scale. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. It's a, again a kind of a diversity of intelligences, you know, from the, you know, the, as you say, back perception. I mean, it means that bats will have back thought <laughs> and microbes <laughs> will have microbial thought, whatever that is, which will be incredibly um, environmentally situated. But I think this idea, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm heartened that, you know, in the last uh, eight years or so. I mean, since uh, Alan Turing's um, uh, centenary, actually, I think that the idea of the uh, kind of the biological thought, biological intelligence, biological computing, actually started to enter into uh, more um, mainstream discourses. And now I think that um, you know that uh, industry is is you know or uh, 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 people working in ICT are thinking about different kinds of intelligence as, as a way of informing our notions of, of, of place and space. So I, I definitely agree with you that I'd like to see more of this than, you know, many more parameters that, uh, you know, that when you see these different scales and these different, um, uh, uh, different ways of being in a place, I, I think it really helps you appreciate um, the resources, the opportunities, you know, the, the you know what's already on offer, and how you can better garden spaces uh, rather than you know flatten them and then you know command absolute control, which I guess is. <laughs> oh well, we are we are at our time now. Is there an, is there another question you want to you want to fit in that you think that we should touch on before we sign off? Um, I guess, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, that the, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's really the idea that the, the, it's the big frameworks, I think, that we, that we, that we need to challenge. And I think once the big frameworks, you know, once we start rattling those, you know, beautiful design opportunities fall out of the, out of the spaces in between them. And I, and I think we're held a little bit of prisoner, obligated in these spaces at the moment, you know, financially and, and you know, habitually, culturally. Um, but but I, I really do think that there's a lot that um, young designers can do. Um, uh, but I think it, it requires a kind of understanding yourself as a designer and having that ethics and having a politics, you know, what is fair, how is power shared? And from that, then you can build, you know, notions of economy. And I do think that that is the business of the ecological designer now. Mm. And it's, it strikes me, I'm sort of thinking to the literature. I mean, we, we are in a sort of situation where, I guess that's one of the sort of advantages maybe of the kind of the EU referendum is, is before that, there was a lot of pressure on people not to speak about politics. Um, I find actually now I have to often go back to a client and tweak a contract because they often try and put a clause in there, particularly if it's anything you know, I'm talking into the stuff in the public domain, that basically is a bit of a gagging clause. And I have to go back to them and say, now, hang on a minute, I'm happy to represent to voice a uh, concept and to be engaged in a project as an external on a project, but don't think you're gonna gag me on, on issues because inherently the issues I deal with, although they're issues of design and engineering and technology, et cetera, they are political because everything is political. Um, and it did feel that until quite recently, a lot of people just didn't feel that they could voice what are basically political views. But today we've seen a shift. And certainly when we look to really all of the most critical um, work in the general area of sort of bio cities, ecological cities, radical new cities of past, really all of the key voices have been very, very um, vocal about issues of politics they've made no no bones about the fact that the new proposals challenge pre-existing constructs economically politically and that fundamentally it's to make these interventions what are political interventions is, is one of the modus of these projects so um 
it kind of feels to me like we are we're on the same hymn sheet here mm -hmm. and our kind of wider peer group are on the same hymn sheet um we know that change comes but it seems that we both of us are sort of having this query at the moment about well how quickly will it come oh we're literally going to see as tends to happen with system collapse very radical very quick collapses yeah. where we see reconfiguration again or are we going to see something a bit more mixed, a bit of a William Gib Gibson or the features here, but it's not evenly distributed? Yeah. Or are we going to see something else again? Yeah, um, unevenly and, distributed. Yeah. And, and the other key worry here, as you said before, is one of, particularly for human systems, what tends to happen is that when the collapse happens, it will tend to be the same old suspects that capitalize on that. And that's partly because, frankly, some of them are ruthless. <laughs> you know, we know, for example, you were talking about with the pandemic, there were um, inequitable forces, there were corrupt forces. But it, it is always the case that um, in where, where there are the vulnerable, you know, where there is, the, in effect, those that could be construed as prey, there will be the predators come in. Mm -hmm. So my, I think my biggest concern right now is, is the fact that historically in human history, when collapses come, very greedy, very corrupt people have come to the table. They've used force, they've used weaponry. Um, and I just wonder if, if, if that will repeat or if, because we've got this major ecological disruption happening, if we've got climate change unfolding, if we've got pandemics unfolding, et cetera, might that just be enough to genuinely reconfigure the system mm -hmm. because of the fact that there is such collapse in some areas that it genuinely only mm -hmm. is those that are working together, that are doing so equitably, that are you know, um, embracing fit for now and for future ideas, as opposed to trying to reconstruct the business as usual model, the one more specifically that served their own particular interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'd want to try to prevent collapse at any, uh, at, you know, uh, at all costs, but the actors that are most able to, uh, um, that take the steps are the ones that won't. So uh, I think we have to shoot up loads of uh, design rhizomes everywhere. <laughs> really trying to uh, mobilize, um, you know, kind of uh, build communities, uh, share ideas, uh, live with our differences. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, kind of feel like we are we are in this together. And I, and, and I think it's, you know, it's great that you hold a podcast like this. And I can just see that there are actually people that turned up. And I think that that's absolutely fantastic. You know, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we've had uh, people that have actually been listening all this time. So I'm, I'm absolutely impressed, and I really hope that uh, you know that there is an undercurrent and a and, and a, a kind of a uh, an, an ethics and and a care for you know the world that we're in and the, the people and the creatures that are with us. Um, and 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 I you know I, the thing is that there's only a few bad apples. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think I think that you know collectively we we can make that we can make the difference. I think we can prevent a degree of collapse. I I, I do hope that it's you know uh, you know that there isn't a just awful awful, awful event. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, but but I think we have to work hard um, to, uh, to 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 uh, engage, let's say, and and put our ethics and our ideas and our preferences into the world. Brilliant. Well, thank you for joining me, Rachel. Um, I will, I have recorded this, so I will put this in the archive. And also I put these up onto YouTube as well. So there they are. They can be, our last one has been seen over 79 times on YouTube and over 80 times post event on here. So we know we should, at the moment, we're probably hitting at about 200 people viewing, which if they are all people that are inspired, our conversations resonating with them hopefully then that will help to catalyze some other conversations um and to you know raise the the visibility of the things that we're speaking to um and uh, yeah it's been great to speak to you today world futures day <laughs> hence the timing and uh yeah hopefully we will we will get to to talk about something else interesting soon so thank you for taking the time rachel Okay, thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you very every much everybody for, for for listening to us. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. We're living in a world that is.